Hello and welcome to the Fleischman is in Trouble episode of Sleep Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the Upper East Side. <laughs> we- <laughs> Uh, I am Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hello, hello. I'm here with Elizabeth Spires. Hello. And we are going to be talking about Fleischman is in trouble and class and money and journalism. And we are going to do it with, obviously, the only person we could possibly do that with, the one and only Taffy Brodessa Agner. Welcome back. It's such a pleasure to be here. Friend of the pod. We love having you on this podcast. Uh, we love having you on the Succession podcast. We love having you on the regular podcast. But um, now I, I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself because, as we will mention on this show, you have many jobs. I'm, I have many jobs. I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, right now on leave for, for a few remaining moments. And I am the author of Fleischman is in Trouble, a novel from Random House that was published in 2019. And it's a Tendent FX limited series, uh, which is streaming only on Hulu and which debuted this week and which will run Um, a new episode every Thursday until December 29th, I believe. And then after that, you could binge it, but you should watch it in real time, I think. So um, so we, yeah, we are going to talk about Fleischmann. We're going to talk about the Upper East Side. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about class. We're going to talk about journalism. We're going to talk about Thanksgiving. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our sponsors, Charles Schwab. At Schwab, a passion for serving clients is not just part of a job description. It's one of their core values. It's this human element that helps set Schwab apart. Stick around to hear how Ray, a Schwab employee who designs digital experiences, works to provide more people with access to the financial tools and knowledge they deserve. We, we have loads to talk about in terms of the entertainment industry, the journalism industry, the Upper East Side and everything. But we should start with plugging your show because that's obviously the most important thing. It's the only thing. Um, it comes out every week. What day of the week? On Thursdays. On Thursdays. At 12.01 a.m. You could watch a new episode of Fleischman is in Trouble. Stay up late on Wednesday night on and Hulu. be ahead of your friends. Yeah. Um, and the reason why... We here at Slate Money care about Fleischman is in trouble, quite beyond the fact that we're just a big Taffy fans, is because the whole series pretty much is an essay on class and money, which are almost, it seems, coterminous in this show. Like they seem to right. be the same thing, which as an Englishman is very always very odd to me. Why? Because in where I come from, you can be, you know, very high class and, you know, you versus non-you, but not have any money. You can be like, you can be upper middle class, but poor. You can be lower class, but rich. You know, someone like... Even recently? Someone like Donald Trump would be the classic example of lower class and rich. Tr- yes. <laughs> yeah, agree. But, but also, but, yeah. I thought those were only plots in Jane Austen novels. But actually... Or Charles Dickens. But actually, it's the same thing. Whenever I would hear in, like, Pride and Prejudice, she only, oh, she has an allowance of only a cabillion (laughs) pounds a year. And everyone felt so bad for her. I'd be like, a cabillion pounds a year? That is not nothing. That is an amazing starter salary for a really good lifestyle. Plus, you have rolling fields and horses but you have a you have the cabili- the problem is the same problem that's in Fleischman which is that it doesn't matter how much money you have it matters how much money the person with the most amount of money has right so there's the relative thing which which you portray in Fleischman which is that you know you want to be as rich as your peers and there is this very human um 
desire to hang out with the people who are richer and more successful than you. You kind of aspire to being in that crowd, even if you're richer than 99% of the population. Um, You're looking at it as a social thing. I'm looking at it from a, let's say you live on the Upper East Side because you work on the Upper East Side. You are a doctor on the Upper East Side. Your children go to school on the Upper East Side. Let's say you have settled on the Upper East Side. You want an apartment. An apartment comes on the market. You go to see it. It needs a down payment of $400,000, let's say. I do not live on the Upper East Side. I am making up figures in my head. You have $400,000 from uh, the inheritance that your uncle left you and also the uh, bonus you got last year and also you've saved a lot. So you have that money. You go to look at the apartment and the realtor tells you somebody just came in with an all cash offer. And therefore, you can't have the apartment that you want. Can you have a lesser apartment? Maybe, but that's going to keep happening until the apartments are sort of not appropriate for what you, like all of class and all of wealth is what you believe you deserve or owed can spend. But that's the essential problem. The essential problem is goods, is spaces in the school you want to go to, the amount of Teslas that were made this year, the amount of money an apartment costs. It's so Right. It's all about scarcity, right? Right. The, we're talking about scarce goods. Right. There's a finite number of Upper East Side apartments, there's a finite number of kindergarten places at 92nd Street. Why? There's a finite number of like these houses in the Hamptons. If there was enough for everyone, then no one would want them. So can we just pause for a quick second? Yeah. And, and maybe you can help me with this, Taffy. But the reason we're talking about the Upper East Side and class and all this is because in Taffy's book and show yeah. is about this dude, Toby Fleischman, a divorced fellow living on the Upper East Side, who is a doctor, and I think he notes in the show or in the book, making close to $300,000 a year. But everyone in his milieu, all the parents at his kids' schools, look down at him as basically like a pauper. They say things to him like, oh, you're a doctor? Good for you. The the, the good for you line comes up a lot. But it's also... But it also, I think, does bespeak a little bit of what I'm talking about in terms of the difference between class and wealth, right? There is some kind of aura of like I'm some kind of a good person by dint of being a doctor that you don't get by dint of being a you know vice president of sales at Deutsche Bank. I think it's neutral. I don't think anybody really does think it's good for him. I think they just have nothing to say (laughs) once, (laughs) once he tells them that he's a doctor. But also he's made to be a doctor because of this strange reality of the fact, not that a doctor is morally good, but because when I was growing up, being a doctor made you rich. Everyone who had a doctor dad was rich. Everyone who had a doctor mom was rich. Like those people were, were absolutely rich. And a way to make a point about the way the economy has changed is that is by saying that being a doctor used to make you this amount of money. The, the amount of money stalled, right? But then these other people came in and figured out loopholes, and their money makes money now in, in an obscene way. It's actually <clears> – <throat> Fleischman is loosely adapted from Capital, that book, that Thomas the, Piketty – like, oh, right. I read that book like you would read – you would read like a like a sad like you would watch terms of endearment. I cried <laughs> at the end. I was like, oh, so all of this, you know, I'm from a family with very little money. Um and I I tried to sort of transcend my class a little bit, like to go from middle class to better middle class in my in my life and to realize that there's nothing to land in because no matter what happens, my money will never be like a soldier out in the field killing others to expand its own its own borders. I don't even know how to do that. I have a a one percent savings account, and no one else will. No one will tell me with the meager savings I have 
how how to make my money make money. Personal personal re- finance questions yeah, for, yeah. with Taffy. Is this there, not but, a per- I thought that's what. <laughs> but no, I want to ask you about that because the big contrast in in the show is between Toby and his ex-wife Rachel who is much richer who can afford the swanky apartments and the place in the Hamptons and the private schools and the social climbing um does she have the knack does she know how to put her money to work does she make money from money or is she just earning money because she has a successful business she is earning money from her successful business purposefully at a rate that will allow her money to make money. You think she has some investments in the hedge funds somewhere? Yes. I think that she has a business manager. And you would manager. know because she is a creature. I know. I made her up. <laughs> and I think she has a business manager. And I think she has people who invest her money for her. And I think she has a business and a lawyer and, and all of the other words and a financial advisor. But in the end, she absolutely has the thing, the sort of maybe point of Fleischman is that you can't really do what you, this idea that I grew up with, that if you just do what you are passionate about and are good at, and you do it at a high level, you will become wealthy, just isn't true anymore. And that that's really shocking for me to find out. Like I heard about the protests in Zuccotti Park. I know the phrase, the disappearance of the middle class, but I didn't really understand that you could be successful at the thing. I mean, we're sitting here and you're all, I just, for the, for the, for the listener, you're all expressionless, but we're journalists. We know that people 10 years older than we are or 15 years older than we are had a lot more money when they were successful as journalists. They also had jobs to choose from. I read that tweet the other day that someone retweeted about how Joe, how Joe from Little Women um, sells that story and wins a hundred dollars or earns a hundred dollars from her pu- her first published story and how how like rates have not gone up since the reconstruction <laughs> era. <laughs> like, like anyone who's it's this book was born of being a journalist who was absolutely as busy as you could be as a journalist working for n- not obscure places and realizing that it's not just you're not wealthy. It's hard to make ends meet. And all of this, of course, depends on priorities. What do you want for your children? What do you? What kind of clothing are you wearing? Are you a two-car household? But it is meaningful to me that I grew up with this idea that if you just work hard at the thing you want to be good at and feel passionately about, that there is – that that kind of success will lead to wealth. Yeah, your Rachel character is so interesting in that respect because you kind of give her this backstory where she grew up with all this financial insecurity, right. and that's what drives her. That's right. what motivates her because she never assumed that that was just going to happen. Right, but she knew that if you worked mm-hmm. hard, you could make money. Like, all she wants is safety and security. That is her motivating. But is that, is is that the she, American dream? If that's dream? all she wants, why is she a theater agent? Like, why not, Why isn't she a hedge fund person or an MBA or something really, really, like, super bo- – I guess because it's fiction. And if it was super boring like that, it would be boring to read about. Or I would ask, as someone who's had me on this podcast before, do you mm-hmm. think her creator is capable <laughs> of writing someone in a hedge fund? But I, I do you have wrote some about a pharma. liver doctor. I you wrote, do liver stuff. I was like, what the – So the, the money stuff <laughs> just leaves my head okay. in a way that – the like, oh, a liver regenerates? That's – beautiful. I can, that'll stick. I have a liver. A hedge fund? Ugh. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card gives you unlimited cash back every day on every purchase. It's real cash you can spend right away. No need to wait and wait for rewards. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone to see your credit limit offer with no impact to your credit score. Subject to credit approval, daily cash is available via an Apple Cash card or as a statement credit. See Apple Card customer agreement for terms and conditions. Apple Cash card is issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC. Accepting an Apple card after your application is approved will result in a hard inquiry, which may impact your credit score. 
Slate Money is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customer surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab believes in breaking down the barriers to investing, making it accessible to all. Ray is a director of user experience. Her passion is making education accessible to all investors. Through digital design and experiences, Ray ensures Schwab's technology works seamlessly for clients so they can make informed decisions about their finances. I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't learn it in school. What is a stock? What is a mutual fund? What are futures? You know, all these different financial instruments. And so every day I come in thinking about the real person who doesn't want to spend their time studying and becoming experts in this, yet they need to have enough knowledge to make sure they're protected and doing the right things. My expertise is always representing what our clients need, how to talk to them in a way that lets us meet them where they are, and always advocating for doing the right thing for them. At Charles Schwab, they're not just financial people, they're people people too. With free investing education and 24-7 support, Schwab offers the tools to help you pursue your financial goals. That's how Schwab makes investing accessible for all. Learn more about what sets Schwab apart at schwab.com slash why Schwab. But I want to go back to this conception of the American dream that if you work really hard at something and successful, then you can become wealthy because it seems, I mean, Emily is scrunching her nose and shaking her head. You know, obviously... This is not true if I become, you know, like if you become a school teacher, no matter how good you are, you're never going to become wealthy. If you become an art historian, no matter how good you are, you're never going to become wealthy. You know, there's lots of um, very skilled and... If you're an, an art historian and you get a post at a good school and they help buy your house, like there there actually is a structure in there. I don't mean super wealthy. I mean... I mean solvent with savings and maybe something to leave your children. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the wealth we're seeing in this show. The wealth we're seeing in the show is the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that Toby Fleischman would have been a rich man except for in the 40 square blocks that Rachel forces him to live, right? That's like that's the point that he could have been a rich man. Or that he could have been a man who felt that he was rich or felt that he was successful and wasn't constantly reminded by these guys in pharmaceuticals or who bought up, you know, insurance policies of AIDS patients. The doctor men of of Long Island of my youth, they were very wealthy. So it was jarring to me to see Toby Fleisch and be treated as just like a but are they? St- so they are still. But if, <clears throat> I think they are still. But if anyone went into it, but their kids who, where on Long Island are we? We okay. are in, uh, we are five towns adjacent. Sure. So there's <laughs> no one in the five towns who's a doctor anymore. In five In the five towns, they are all in their family business mm-hmm. or they are all in, in finance or they're lawyers for people in finance. It's just that the the careers that make money have changed. Yeah. But it maybe not but anything the more than that. that. But the careers that make money have changed. The, the making of money 
the literal making of money is the career. Yeah. Which yeah. is like not even something I can hold on to in my head. I don't understand it even. And I don't understand how you leave a, a day and feel that you've done something. I, I don't even I don't I don't understand it well enough. But I do know that it came and it made wealth so exponential that that it doesn't matter how much you make. It matters how much they make. If you want goods. That's true. There's been, isn't there, Felix, isn't there research, like, if you live in a rich area and you're not as rich as the richest person, you're less happy than you would be if you lived in a more diverse area? And there's Yes, a- that, 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 this is research. It has been shown. You are 100, you're absolutely happier um, if you make uh, $300,000 in a neighborhood where everyone else is making $200,000 than you are if you make $500,000 in a neighborhood where everyone else is making a million. Is that because your purchasing power goes up or because your baseline kind of resets? No, like to- if you, no keeping purchasing power constant um, you, it's just like once you get past about $70,000 or so, wealth becomes about relative status rather than absolute what you can buy. Right. It's all relative. Yeah. Wealth is all relative, hence the cabillion. Well, it's not all like, as I say, like, pounds, there, there is a... your allowance <laughs> back then when your father, when your father died from <clears throat> consumption and left you and your sisters unmarried and penniless with a cabillion. <laughs> with only pounds. one servant. I know. <laughs> with one servant who's who seems more like an intern, frankly, than. <laughs> but by the way, back to your first question, class in England is very much about a title and affiliation, right? Whereas right, America exactly. is conceived so, as a place that so we you get have, off a boat and you just start climbing. We have um, right now the richest prime minister in British history, right? Like he is just so happy for astonishingly him. rich. Really? Um, he's worth, I think, eight hundred million dollars or something like that. He married well. He married well. Um, but the point is that he he grew up sort of upper middle class. He went to good schools. He went to Stanford, you know. But he w- didn't grow up in that ultra rich milieu. He married into it, and the fact that he's ultra rich does not give him social standing. In fact, if anything, it detracts from his social standing because people start, you know, muttering under under their breath about his wife's non-dom status and is he really English and that kind of thing. Because, of course, wealth at those levels, especially in the UK, is always very international. Um, and so it makes him seem, you know, less one of us, more one That's of so them. That's so interesting. That's explaining something to me I never understood when I profiled Tom Hiddleston, which was that he went to Eton, yes. which made him... Fancier, yes. but it's not good to be fancier. Correct. And also, Lily Allen would sometimes sing in a Cockney accent, and people were enraged because she was wealthy. But is I don't know, maybe those are not related. No, but they're, I, they're, they're totally related. Yeah. Wait, you're saying it's like uncool to be super rich in certain circles, or it's un-English? Like, wear it. like you're yeah. not Un-English. like something like it's, it's like strange. why really they used to say like the really rich wasps would wear like the um, threadbare sweaters and things because they didn't spend their money or they didn't want to appear to be yeah, you, showy you, off. You don't show off as much. Um, you don't show off as much, right? You know, and this is why, I mean, but this is also true in the United States, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, uh, I was talking about the US. And the, and the very conspicuous displays of wealth as you get, you know, say the Donald Trump's Trump. Trump's gold toilet or the, whatever. You know, exactly. The, the you know, mean, people who cover them. A Real Housewives episode. Or, or the, <laughs> you know, the, the crypto bros with their Lamborghinis or whatever. Like, Tungsten and cubes. That is, no one thinks that that is sophisticated or, a, you know, high class thing to do. Right. And then you go, you know, you know, you visit Miami or Monaco or you know Dubai or one of these places where people you know love to f- show off how much money they have, and yeah, again, they feel kind of steeped in money, but also definitely not what you consider to be high class right. places. Does anyone care about class anymore? I guess is my question. Well, isn't that what your entire you know Fleshman is about? It's not. It's 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 about class and it's about money but it is it's and it's very much about old money versus new money in class but old money versus new money in actual practicality and that the new money is never as much as the old money because the old money has been earning itself for so many years in fact i was 
trying to explain to my children when I read Capital in the 21st <laughs> century why I was crying. Um, and I showed them there's like a almost cart like a, a there's a documentary of it, but there's a shorter one on YouTube that that just lays it out to you. <laughs> They didn't cry from that because they don't yet understand it really and they were very young. But I guess it doesn't matter to the people who are the crypto bros and the Lamborghinis. Like maybe they're just enjoying their new wealth. I think that everything I'm talking about, which sounds like a vanity, is really about survival. It's about we all judge each other's metrics of what we think of as survival, right? Like – some people think you have to send your child to a private school. Some people think you have to send your child to camp. You know, in, in my family growing up and in a lot of families I knew, it didn't matter how much money you had. You had to send your child to a Jewish day school. Like that was a, an absolute value. There was no – it was not a compromisable thing. You did not know a few people in public school because – or. I'm sure I'm sure there were, but it was the school wouldn't make it easy for you because it was it was a thing of what what was considered in those families, not not my own as not my current family as a thing of survival. So we decide what we need beyond food and water and shelter that is survival. And then we make it a rule and we work for it. And. I guess what was surprising to me and what, what what the book was born of was the the hoarding of goods at the top that there wasn't a, that you could, that there wasn't enough for everyone. Yeah, there's a, just coincidentally, I was reading a book called "Why We're Restless," and it's just entirely about why well-off middle-class people are you know dissatisfied. And there was a quote, and it was from either Montaigne or, or de Tocqueville, where he said something to the effect of, you know, when you have a kind of monolithic community where everybody's middle class, the, the end products are just envy and anger all the time. <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> so they even is, knew then. <laughs> but, so is that right, though? I mean, you know, if you go back to an era of greater equality, say the... The brief 50s, era. <laughs> 60s, I don't know. Like, was, was I feel like you, there was less envy and anger when everyone had you know when especially if you were white you more or less had the same degree of wealth as your neighbors and you didn't have that kind of jealousy of people with vastly more than you as, as far as i understand that was a very brief moment in time but also right. the spread was the spread was less right. and also we assigned morality to that right we said if you worked hard you could get there. And in that space, there's a decision to say, I'd like to spend more time with my family. I would like to not work on weekends or whatever it is that gets you there. It was a brief period of time, but the spread wasn't so big, right? Like, have we ever been in a time where sal the salaries of middle class people who call themselves successful are so disparate? Right. I mean, if you just look at the CEO to worker pay ratio from the time you're talking about, it right. was it was like probably like 60 to one. And no, now it's less it's, it was like 20. Yeah. And yeah. now it's, I think, like 500 to one or something like that. And the, the cost classic. of higher ed going up as much as it has when that's one of the biggest class mobility tools still. Right. Yeah. The things that used that used to be easy signifiers of middle class wealth are now really just for rich people, like good college or vacations. Um, you have to be actually really rich to have those. You can't just be like. Regular middle class, right? Doctor Schlub, right? <laughs> you can't be Doctor Schlub. Doctor Schlub. I, I feel like I feel like Doctor Doctor Schlub on on three hundred grand. If he didn't live in that forty block radius, could easily afford Disney well, World. That's what I was thinking because it, it's like that pandemic arbitrage. Everyone who was making three hundred thousand, like Toby Fleischman, and felt poor, moved somewhere cheaper and now feels rich. And now it's rich. Yeah. yeah. So maybe well, the the wife. When I lived in New him. Jersey, I felt that I lived among. People who had the same income, and I'm trying. I've been thinking about what you said before. I'm trying to think if I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> He's left. My husband would have said I was miserable, but it's because I didn't like living in the suburbs. I didn't like that the only way to have equality was to move to a suburb, to move to a place outside of a major city, where, which I think has its own value. Granted, it's this major city, which is a nightmare <laughs> in terms of affordability, but you know. 
This episode is brought to you by Sax.com, which is the solution to the perennial problem of what do I get the person who has everything? How do I pick out the perfect gift? A quick scroll of the Sax.com holiday gift guide is the easy way to shop for everyone on your list. They have everything from whiskey glasses to handheld weights to beauty sets to fine jewelry. Sax.com editors have curated the best presents like La Mer skincare sets hand-picked by the beauty team and cozy Montclair beanies that everyone wants to be wearing for the office commute. For the hardest to please, the editors at Sax.com have picked out Baccarat barware and Versace home decor. Sax digital stylists are even available to give you free gifting help and personalized recommendations whether you're shopping for others or for yourself. Plus, free shipping, free returns every day at Sax.com. With the great resignation, inflation on the rise, and a future recession on everyone's minds, money is everywhere in everything fueling our lives. If you're a fan of Slate Money and are curious to learn something new and exciting about money every week, have a listen to the Planet Money podcast from NPR. It's a different kind of world, Planet Money. It's one where the complex economy actually makes sense. It's one which is funny. It's one which is entertaining. It's economics, but it's down to earth. Each week, Planet Money presents its listeners with the big and small stories from around the world, covering parts of the economy that you might not have known even existed. It has a fantastic staff, including Slate Money favorite, Mary Childs. And you can tune in every week for entertaining stories and insights about how money shapes our world. Stories that just can't be found anywhere else. Listen now to Planet Money from NPR wherever you get your podcasts. Let's talk a little bit about the media industry since this is, you know, where we all live yeah. apart from New York. And so we can ask you, what what have you learned in your experience of moving from print to television like the, the, just the amount of money obviously just goes through the roof and it's just i imagine it's a very different world it's one i don't really know well you could look up this world like there are writers guild of america the union um as opposed to the mini series um <laughs> the writers guild minimums so Calculate the most you've ever made on a magazine story, be it you went to Russia for it, be it you were in danger for it. And now let me tell you that the minimum you could be paid for a an hour-long drama script is $32,000. Let me tell you more about it. It doesn't have to be true. It doesn't have to be fact-checked. It doesn't have to have paragraphs. It does not even have to get to the margin. Like it, it is just words in a very slender, just... in a slender column on a page, and it's not fair. Can you introduce all. me to people? How, how it's it's long, shocking. I mean, I feel long, like I don't know. Does like, it does take? it put a target on me to be this frank? But I'm still in shock over it. I, I feel that I, that talking about money is a very valuable thing for everybody. But like, it's still shocking to me. I still a little bit it's I'm resentful of it. I I worked really hard as a journalist to make much less than Let's that just be per clear story. how that compares yeah. to an article these days yep. where what you write 2000 words and you maybe you get $1500. Yeah. You're not much. you're not going to get to 32000. You're not going to get you yeah. you would have to do. write I mean the 32 articles to get yeah. to $32000. It's really, it's very shocking. And then you take and then you take a a book and you cut it up into eight parts and you write each of this like it's meaningful. It like it allowed me to leave New Jersey where I was very unhappy and where we were all very unhappy and and it 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 was it was good, but it was very upsetting. <laughs> it was very upsetting that the people I know have dedicated their lives to to newspaper reporting, to making sure that we all are informed, to saving our democracy, are it's it's different. 
like to pull back a little bit. If we live in a world where doing journalism or being a doctor is like not a money making profession, and so there's like a sorting that's going on that's probably kind of bad, right? right. Like the smartest people who need money don't become doctors, teachers, right. journalists, et cetera. And those professions become overrun by less smart people maybe or more privileged people, like in our case in journalism. If only rich people who went to Harvard become journalists, that's kind of a problem, bigger picture for what gets reported and what people think is important, blah, 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 blah. Like that's all why this kind of matters, big picture, besides us being frustrated or maybe just me now. No, I'm, no, we're all frustrated. A new, a new industry. Um, I'm, being, I'm still. You know. I still but, work at the New York Times. But, yeah, but Taffy, back there. Uh, on, <laughs> on, 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 this is the the big question I I had after, especially watching the show more than the book, is um, everyone in this show is a terrible person. Is it? Is it like? <laughs> really? The kids, the children are nice. Maybe the children. Do you think everyone's a terrible person in this show? Well, I mean, okay, let me. I think they're it. all going through midlife crises. But, but, but what I will say is that the though. not everyone is a terrible. That's probably a, wow. a, an extreme way of putting it. But certainly, the way that the Upper East Side is presented, sure, is that it is sure. a very <laughs> terrible place and incredibly superficial and just not a place that any right-thinking person would ever want to set foot in, basically. Is is that... Do you think that the Upper East Side of Fleischman is in trouble on Hulu is, like, <laughs> is the Upper East Side? Or is that, like, a... a that's a an great exaggeration question. and a caricature. So when I interviewed Jonathan Franzen, he was selling his apartment on the Upper East Side. And he... I hope I'm quoting him correctly. He he felt like, you know, the Upper East Side was almost the last middle class neighborhood in New York. Yet one more reason to think that Jonathan Franzen is a dick. But yeah. no, 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 no. If you go <laughs> east, of excuse first me. Avenue. If you go east, of, my first apartment, <laughs> my first apartment as somebody with no parental help, making. Twenty-two thousand dollars a year in nineteen ninety-nine was on the Upper East Side because some of it is so far away from a subway. Not anymore. So that so maybe that's not that's changing or no longer true. But at the point where he was talking, I will defend him here and say that it was absolutely true that it was a place where you could have people who were starting out, people who were very well established, people who were established off the Mayflower and and, you know, living on Fifth Avenue. And that's how I felt about it. And then when I wrote Fleischman is in Trouble, it was because I needed money. I, like, again, bad decisions in history. Like, I wrote a novel. Like, I went oh, yeah. to journalism <laughs> to be solvent. And I wrote a novel because I needed money. But I, I, need, I knew that I was someone who maybe could get her novel read, right? So I wrote this novel, and I have this aunt who lives on the Upper East Side, and she she bought the studio next door to her the way you do when you can. <laughs> and when it became clear that I was going to finish this novel, I holed up in that studio every weekend because my children were so little that they didn't understand why I was ignoring them. And I went to this place, and I would go outside – and I would see all these women. She lives on 94th Street. So it was right near the 92nd Street Y. And I would see all of these T-shirts. And you would stand in line for a salad only to find out that it was $26 when you were done, like, adding tofu, which is a bean. <laughs> and I wrote it from a place of this sh realization that it's not getting better for me. That my future is missing basketball games, miss it like letting my kids essentially raise themselves while I pursue this thing that I was wrong about. Like it didn't make me solvent. It worked out for me. I'm so lucky that it worked out for me. But it was that was my last gamble. My first gamble was going into journalism, <laughs> and my last gamble was here's a novel because the only thing that could be worse than this. 
I mean, I was writing 11 stories at once. That's what I was doing. I was, everyone remembers how much I was publishing. I was writing 11 feature stories at once. And I needed something to change. That's that's how this happened. So is the Upper East Side, that's the Upper East Side that I saw through my incredibly bitter eyes when I was missing soccer games and basketball games to finish writing this book, yes. And the thing that we have learned from all of this is... And also, wait, wait, wait. I want to say one other thing. I want to say one other thing about that. It is important to know that that is very often the lens journalists view things through. When I was writing about Gwyneth Paltrow, it became clear to me that why does everybody hate Gwyneth Paltrow was a question I went in with. And the answer was... I don't know if they do. She's a successful businesswoman. She was a popular actress. It seems like the people who write about her do. (laughs) Why? (laughs) Because we're all journalists. Like, we should be disqualified from writing about people like Gwyneth Paltrow because of how we see people like Gwyneth Paltrow. On which note, I think that's it. Uh, So, yeah, thanks thanks for listening. Thanks for being sticking with us for as long as you've been listening to Slate Money, which for some of you is getting on for eight years. I am Just super grateful episode. for that. Um, <laughs> this episode alone, alone is eight years long. We're, we're up there with Joe Rogan. Um, we will be back next week with a slightly more normal episode of Slate Money. But in the meantime, many thanks to Anna Phillips for producing, Slate for hosting, and all of you guys for writing in. Slate Money at Slate.com. Oh.